So, AEW on April 19th, and I'm so just tired of talking about this stuff lately. I'm not going to be as caustic as I am possibly analytical. They were trying to do some things here. It's just that nobody there has actually got the... They, they have a beautiful puzzle that they've got a thousand-piece puzzle, but everybody's got different pieces of it. And no, and nobody's interlocking their own shit. Um, like the lockers. Like the lockers. See, I know it went back there. Uh, and speaking of lockers, here's another guy that probably got stuffed in one when he was in high school. Jungle Boy comes out and it enters and starts to talk. And before he gets two words out, music interrupts him. Thank goodness. And here came Sammy Guevara. And he comes out, and he starts to talk, and music interrupts him. <laughs> and it's Darby, of course. Now we've got the three challenging pillars. Jungle Boy, Sammy Guevara, and Darby Allen. At least they're doing something on a weekly basis with this, even if it's wrong, as Mama Cornette used to say. I'm going to talk about some good stuff and some bad stuff. With all three of these guys in the ring, it's not a great visual when all three of them look like unkempt teenagers dressed in grubby, unwashed street clothes. There, there, it's not that everybody has to be in a suit, but they just look especially... Darby's gimmick is he's unkempt. I know that. Jungle Boy just looks like he doesn't give a shit and sammy could at least look like he's going out to a fucking nightclub somewhere and get away with it but instead he looks like he's going to a skate park somewhere and getting away with it and here's what happened and then i'll talk about why it probably shouldn't have darby told sammy that he was the least qualified of the bunch of them for a title match because while Darby and Sting treat each other as equals, Jericho doesn't treat him like an equal. He holds him back. So this is their version of a shoot interview. <laughs> and Darby tells Jungle Boy that Jungle Boy had to work the least hard because he's in the California clique. And he was jealous at first of Jungle Boy, but then he realized that nothing about Jungle Boy intimidates him at all. And then Jungle Boy, oh my fucking God. The sounds you heard from the Tampa St. Petersburg area was Eddie Graham spinning in his grave to the point where Florida <laughs> almost became its own fucking continent. And then Jungle Boy came back at Darby Allen and told him that, well, I see these kids out here painting their faces like you. Yes, I don't see any of the kids out there wearing fucking loincloths like Jungle Boy. Do you? There's probably a fucking statute against that anyway, kids in loincloths. But nevertheless, kids paint their faces like you. But Darby Allen, if, we, if they knew who you really are like we do, you're antisocial, you're unfriendly, and you're rude to people that are not as cool as you. And Darby's there because you didn't make you didn't want to be here to begin with. You didn't make it as a skateboarder. Oh my fucking god. I I don't know where to start as a former booker, matchmaker, agent, producer, talent scout, instructor, slash promo trainer. <laughs> My God, what it, what they've done is they've accentuated in trying to do a shoot promo that all the smart fans will think, oh, they've accentuated every single negative quality of, of two of their alleged baby faces and Sammy, who, who knows what the fuck he is, including himself at this point, because he, he switches back and forth from fucking heel to baby face in, in mid promo multiple times over trying to pull this off, this shit off somehow. And uh, 
and I ain't, I ain't even got to him yet speaking, but just it, so far. For one thing, Jungle Boy, as we've mentioned, is where Jungle Boy is going to be. And it's just, it, that's fine. He's, I'm not saying set fire to him, but it, it, he shouldn't be in this picture. It's confusing the issue. And Sammy is the one least qualified for a title match for the shoot reasons that they just told us. So it should be Darby being built and programmed with a single-minded focus to fucking take MJF down before the Ric Flair kiss dealing, wheeling, dealing, and Dusty Rhodes son of a plumber, every man dichotomy that we fucking spoke of last week. But instead, they're tearing, and again, Darby, they've got something. They've got something with him. The kids paint their faces like him. He's got the charisma. He can make the fucking diving, flipping shit. It, he uses his body as a weapon, and he should be the one doing the majority of that in the company instead of everybody, and it'd mean even more. And you can draw money with this fucking guy. So this mid-card... At best, babyface with the personality of coleslaw. Not even the vinegar kind, just the fucking prickly, tasteless white kind. <laughs> says, you're antisocial, you're unfriendly and rude to people, not as cool as you are, when his whole thing is wrapped up in all the kids the uncool kids want to be the outsiders the misfits they want to be like this guy well he don't like them if they ain't cool and you don't like wrestling you just did it because you flunked out as a skateboarder i'm not sure how you fail as a skateboarder i don't know what how many job openings there are for skateboarders but well endorsements once you've become a skateboarder is there <laughs> Do you where do you go to hire on to be a skateboarder? Well, it's not like that. You have to illustrate your skills uh, on you the have to do open field com and completely for free and risk breaking your fucking neck before somebody will pay you because you didn't break your neck yet. He seems good at that. The point is, they're tearing down their only attraction with this fucking insistence on stealing a Japanese angle because there were four pillars in the company of New Japan in 1990-whatever that now there have to be four pillars, even though this is the most fucking lopsided fucking four-legged table I've ever seen in my life. And then <laughs> Jungle Boy actually put Sammy over more than he did per as a person and a wrestler than Darby Allen, but then still called him a scumbag piece of shit and shit got bleeped. And remember, that's a theme. We're going to go through the program here. And then Sammy tore down Jungle Boy and Darby because both of them were handpicked to be in their spots. And then he bitched because I said they weren't booked on a pay-per-view or he wasn't. And, Sammy's promo was more babyface than the other guys at one point until, and he tried to fire up and walked away from the people he was talking to, to talk to the hard camera, to get, to try to get, here's what I wrote. This is a psychological mess, not helping any of the three inside mealy mouthed complaining three guys who don't know how to verbally take care of themselves or the others whining at each other with bad material your thoughts yes i would agree with all that it was utterly fascinating watching it darby it seems is getting more and more confident on the mic yes and i like darby but i feel like everyone needs a cap of like i don't know 30 seconds or 45 <laughs> seconds or something everyone gave a long speech jungle boy is not fitting in this at all to me he gets the pop because he comes out first and people like to wave their arms to his music and not even that many people. Usually the camera has to find people and it's like three people sitting next to each other waving their arms around. And Sammy, I think, has been pretty good in this. Darby had something great going with MJF last week, so let's do this. I, I don't disagree with what you said before, but to make this a little bit of a bigger question, and I know I'm not the only one feeling this way because I'm now starting to see things and we're starting to get emails even about it. 
They did something similar to this a few weeks back with all four of them in the ring. A few weeks back, maybe a month back, I don't know. Now this. The ring ropes all of a sudden are red, white, and blue. It's starting to feel more and more like WWE. Like WWE Raw in the, like, <laughs> I don't want to say in the mid-90s, just because just of the ropes, but it's starting to feel more WWE-like in terms of opening up with, I, I didn't even look, you would know, 15, 20 minutes of... These yeah. guys just one after it was another. 15. It seemed like 45, but it was 15. You, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, it's starting to feel like a different show than AEW has always been. I don't know if that's the influence of the new producer that they brought in or just, you know, this is what they think it should look like. But I don't know. That That's the other thing. It's starting to feel like a different company in some of these segments. I shouldn't say that, but you know. Well, well, no, I, I see what you mean, but let's clarify, not content, well, formatting-wise, concept-wise maybe, but not content-wise, because I don't remember a WWF or WWE program ever starting out with three allegedly top talents, talents being utilized in a prominent position, coming out and shoot listing each other's drawbacks <laughs> and unqualifications for why they shouldn't be there. Instead, when you've got three guys that all want a title shot, usually they're coming at it from the direction of, I deserve this. They already, it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that they feel that they deserve it and they deserve it more than each other, not... I'm the only one that deserves it because you people have been given your spot hand handed by the promoter or pick by the whatever the fuck <laughs> and talking about the shoot legitimate bad qualities that the only popular baby face in the equation has Darby Allen. Can you imagine if they did this like in the eighties and they said, go out there and do you <laughs> cheat on your wife and do drugs everywhere. Oh, yeah? Well, you have a girlfriend in every town and you're sleeping with Pat Patterson. Like, it would have just been a ridiculous mess. There would have been literally <laughs> le legitimate fist fights uh, two minutes into promos if they had, had done this, the equivalent of this to each other. Yes. But anyway, then after all that happens, MJF comes out and blisters all three of them and announces the Pillars Tournament where the winner will face MJF for the title at double or nothing. He pulls a name out of a hat. He gave a production assistant comes, brings him a hat with the names that he calls for. And he pulls a name out of the hat and it's Darby Allen. So Darby gets the buy in the first round and Sammy and jungle Jack boy have to face, face each other tonight to determine who gets Darby. And here's another, they bleeped, MJF saying that the production assistant that came out, it looked like he had pubic hair glued to his face. And then he said shit that they plainly didn't bleep or even missed, uh, didn't try to bleep. There's uh, things going on with the language on the program now. I'm having a feeling they get a certain number of shits or goddams approved, and if it's not on the list, they're trying to bleep this shit. But anyway, it took us 15 minutes to get there. And again, with the... I mean, if they're trying to appeal to young people, this looks like a bunch of... Or a bunch of... In this case, it looked like three teenage fucking skateboarding wrestlers, you know, arguing with each other. But it didn't do anything for any of them, especially Darby. I thought his hurt the worst just by having to go through this. Instead of, if they'd have taken the same energy trying to, that they've spent trying to shoehorn Jungle, Jungle Perry and Sammy into this thing in having a coherent, focused push for Darby as a underdog defying all odds, winning some kind of, getting a big singles victory, and then maybe another two or three weeks after that out of the blue, and verbal interaction that Sammy, or not, that uh, Darby and MJF have had already could have been figured into the, and you'd, you'd be building a money match instead of this fucking foolishness. If they do this... I guess two week tournament or whatever this is to build up to the pay per view and still end up with a four way. Is it worth it to do all this? 
No, God, no. So they definitely can't do that. If they end up with a four-way, then Jesus Christ, that will be the... A four-way with all these jokers will not sell as well as MJF and Darby with a story and a reason and a and people caring about it. Then it there then it's going to be the same audience that already buys whatever they buy or whatever they sell that just wants to see four guys diving off a fucking ladder. But they've got national television and they've got weeks and they would have an opportunity to do something like what Punk did what maybe they've done a time or two before is get the people that don't normally buy the shit that just watch it for free, but say, you know what? They've got me with this one. I might want to see this. I'll spend fucking whatever. The cock is free now, so I might as well pay for the pussy. Anyway. What? <laughs> what a segue to the next match. Ruby Soso and Tony Storm with Soraya in the corner against Jamie Hayter and Dr. Britt Baker. And of course, it's they're in Britsburg, Britt's hometown. And remember, we're, we're going to see a bunch of alleged violence tonight, attempted violence, but they already have to start with the very first match, and it's the girls, and especially with what they're going to do later on, they jumpstart this girls tag team match on the entrance ramp and they have an incredibly fake looking four-way fight on the floor. The whole first two minutes looked like they found four girls outside standing in line to buy a ticket and put them in a ring and said, do the shit you've seen on television. It was 100 miles an hour. It was sloppy. It was in and out of the ring, constant four-way, awkward. And then they went to the fucking break. And I didn't come back. But what, what was that? I thought it was an all right match. There are definitely <laughs> elements of sloppiness. I think Hater's really good. Hater's too good for AEW. Well, the problem Gosh. is she's working with a sack of wet hammers then. This was, I believe, some kind of statement because it was a women's tag team match. No, I'm serious. It was a women's tag team match. It was the first match on the show in, I guess, segment two. So there is something to be said there. The fact that they had this match. I know it is Britt's hometown and her mom's at ringside getting spray painted or whatever the hell was going on. But this is a women's match early in the show. So they're trying to... And uh, based on where they go later on in the show, they're trying to do something here. Yeah, they're trying to do something there. Um, anyway, uh, something else they were trying to do with another hometown boy, Rene Moxley Good, was in the back with Wardlow. This is apparently his hometown also. And it's starting to be, it's like the old fucking joke in wrestling. I can't do a job here. It's too close to my hometown. He barely got the words out. He, he, Wardlow does not seem comfortable with the microphone, but they keep putting him in positions where the one's in front of him. And he barely got the words out to introduce Arn Anderson. Because remember long ago, Wardlow was in one of the groups that came and went that was involved with Tully. So Tully was in his corner sometimes. Right? <laughs> and and they refer to that that he used to have a horseman. Well, now you got another horseman, and in comes Arn Anderson. It is the first time we've seen Arn in what, a year? Since Cody left. Since Cody left, I think. So over but he's still there, apparently. Or come back. And Arn Does his son still work there? Wasn't his son wrestling there too? He wrestled there once or twice. That was over a year ago. Uh, nevertheless, Arn basically said Tully taught Wardlow how to play checkers and they're going to start playing chess. So now Arn's going to be in Wardlow's corner tonight against Hobbs, who is so already in the battle of corner men. I think Arn outranks QT Marshall. It's just two, more, 
two weeks in a row where Cody Rhodes is featured in one way, either mentioned or shown on this show. Isn't that weird? Well, and maybe they're trying to entice him back. Well, that's for, not going to happen. Who else <laughs> shows up also, I think, was a friend of Cody's or was in Cody's group. What a, never, we, we don't want to. We don't want to spoil the surprise. So the next thing out in the ring was Kenny and the Buckaroos. And they ruin Kansas. And then they get in the ring. Here's not only the EVPs, but their top main event wrestlers. And they look more bummish or bummified or reeking of bummery. Then the other three did when they got in the ring, sloppy fucking street clothes, shorts, tennis shoes, no socks, hole in the fucking pants. And twinkle toes speaks and the whole arena goes to sleep, even though he's trying to be serious. I know, but there's no, there's no fire. There's no oomph there. There's no passion. He doesn't believe, maybe he doesn't have a personality. I've heard that that may be the case, but there's no, charisma in him when he speaks um but he talked about all the things that the bbc had done to you know him and the buckaroos and then brian danielson suddenly appears on the screen calling them all amateurs and while they're looking at him on the screen calling them amateurs the rest of the bbc jump in on the evps from behind and they have a big fight in the in the ringside and they in the arena they do everything that the girls just did 15 minutes beforehand and but this went on for much longer and i mean it was again it's every indie wrestler's wet dream to be involved in something like this where it's actually on tv and people can see it where they're doing all kinds of cool brawling that looks like shit when you focus. It's, it's a lot of meaningless sound and motion, but if you focus on any one single thing that's being done instead of the whole picture, it all looks like shit. makes no sense. At one point, Wheeler Useless took a Northern Lights suplex on the floor and was up throwing punches seconds later. Yeah, and Moxley would go down for things, but he'd come right back up. It's not like he sold anything. I sell nothing. I'm invincible. <laughs> and the, and then as the BBC is, you know, finally is in firm control, Danielson comes out with the microphone and cuts a promo on him or starts cutting a promo on him. I told you you were amateurs. Well, here comes Don Fallis down the entry ramp holding a chair and he gets halfway down the ramp looks at the scene gets scared drops the chair and runs back to the back so then the bbc isolate twinkle toes i guess the maddie and nikki were thrown to the floor or whatever and danielson pulls out a screwdriver and it's that they're gonna hold twinkle toes while we are expected to believe that brian danielson is going to stab him with a screwdriver but then suddenly here comes don Fallis again with take a shit and he sends take a shit to the ring to help out where's hangnail page hold that thought and take a shit jumps in the ring and clears the ring of everybody all by himself brian bails out on his own but everybody else gets sent out by this one guy. The And isn't that the hangnail page spot? Or is there trouble over in dipshit Cowboyville, Virginia? You would think that's the hangman page spot. Again, he got beat up by these uh, Blackpool folks. And they have been, for a while, from what I understand, teasing things with Don Callis and Takeshita on various programs that they produce. So it's not outrageous that he went back and got him. Well, the whole thing was out. Someone has to do the job. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to get dirty. Moxley uh, has become one of my favorites. Can I just say that? Oh, come on. If you go into it watching it, knowing this guy's the worst fucking wrestler in the world, 
He's quite enjoyable to watch. You know he's going to fall down at least once. You know he's going to start throwing punches that don't hit or elbows that just look bad, but he's going to like grimace like he's really doing something. I've started to enjoy the awfulness in his wrestling. And the whole Blackpool Combat Club is just so ridiculous. And then Danielson now is like the leader of the whole thing. I get a kick out of that. I did want to ask you one other thing about this, though. The fact that they're doing this feud and the way they're doing it so far between Blackpool Combat Club and the Elite, it would almost be, you know, for all the talk about doing FTR and CM Punk versus the Elite after this, kind of feels like they're blowing out the big program for the factions right now. Like It would almost be bad to do something like that right after this, right? Oh, you mean it, it would be bad to follow up Follow this, this follow with that program. FTR and Punk versus... No, you always want to try to build and get bigger as you go along. It, look, regardless of what they do between the BBC and the elite, it will appeal to the... They're preaching to the choir, as Jim Ross and many other Southern individuals would say. It will appeal to the people that are already going to watch it or buy it to begin with. The reason why that the natural match is the elite versus punk and FTR is simply because it's something that even the, not only will the smart AEW fans believe that there could be something legitimate about it because there is and was, but also it's intriguing enough to get the people that came with Punk to come back, to get the people that might watch television but not buy a big pay-per-view to fucking do so because there's something extra to it. It's It's got its own built-in attraction. It's not just going to be aggressive parkour with bad indie wrestling and hardcore shit mixed in. So... The idea that you wouldn't, if you could put, and and the reason why FTR been grouped in this, and now apparently the AEW fans are mad at some of them because they're on his side. Well, no shit. They're on the side of the big star that actually does good wrestling because they are, take pride in their wrestling. Imagine that. But they're friends, and people know that too. And if even if there is not legitimate heat that we know of, between FTR and the Buckaroos, people can believe there could be, because there's obviously at least professional jealousy on one part we know of for sure. So that's the reason why that's your biggest match. Instead of this convoluted indie wrestling style bullshit that they're doing with the BBC and, and the Buckaroos and Twinkle Toes. That's for the people that are already there. That's fine. I'm sure they'll love it. But that doesn't mean you can't do something bigger that appeals to more people for more obvious reasons involving better talent that will give a better performance and build the thing better because they're more serious about it. So it would be an upgrade, yes. Men and women on both programs, and as we just talked about on Raw, too many factions, faction warfare everywhere. Well, that's another thing. As as much of a dearth of really top level star power, main event singles attractions that they have in this company to begin with, and they've got Danielson mixed up in this jobber stew, and as well as you know, they want to tie Kenny and Maddie and Nikki up because that way they get to play with their friends and they get to work together and they get the cool Kansas entrance music and at least it's putting them in one match where, you know, we don't have to fucking skip two or three different matches. So that that's fine. They've lived their usefulness in that company as box office draws to begin with, in my opinion, except for potential punk and FTR contest. But they're they're hiding Danielson in this mess, and Claudio never got a chance to really do anything. He's a great worker. He's not going to be the next Stone Cold Steve Austin. 
But goddamn, he just got thrown into this. And now he's mired down in the middle of it. Yeah, he's done. But l- listen, you brought up Kansas. I haven't asked you about this. The idea that they're using this as their theme song and Tony's paying for it. The visual of when the song first hits and they're on the stage in a silhouette and then the song gets really big and all of a sudden we see them, that works. Then they come to the <laughs> ring. Then they get in the ring. The song is still going and they're like waiting for the next round of the chorus. And so is the audience because the <laughs> audience is silent <laughs> while the young bucks are walking around singing the song to themselves. <laughs> And then the audience gets ready for the big chorus of what you may remember was a big hit song had nothing to do with wrestling. So what is Tony really paying for here? Just the moment of them on the stage? Because there's too much of them singing the song to themselves while the crowd sits there. (laughs) It happened here, but I've seen it before, too. That's what made me think about it. What he's paying for is, you know, somebody to go through and pick out the brown M&M's. He just their self-indulgent fantasies now that they've found a sucker that will suffer their presence. Would Tony Khan license the Beatles for a wrestler? Well, what song? For who? It it would have to fit really good, wouldn't it? Like if they said, Hey Tony, this would fit me really good. He'd have to be he'd have to have his arm twisted like that. I mean it I I would think at some point. You know, they draw the line somewhere. He licensed the Trogs for one week. Remember that? Yes. <laughs> he got, he, instead of signing the wrong one-legged wrestler, he, he licensed the wrong Wild fucking thing. cover of the song. Yeah. But then he, and then he, he's given, the thing is, it has to be his pet or somebody that he, I guess, is scared by. Because Moxley probably intimidates him. Tony, I can see Moxley, Tony being the only person on earth that Moxley could legitimately intimidate. That's right. Um, It's like the movie Cobra. I'm half Sylvester Stallone, half badass, half Cobra. (laughs) And I, but then again, Tony gave his favorite little mascot, two different songs that he had to license. Yeah. So he only does it for people. He either is, you know, in love with or is scared of. So, Somebody ought to intimidate him into some fucking skinners. We'd have something to listen to. Speaking of intimidation, it used to be that if you had an intimidating professional wrestler like a Wardlow or a powerhouse Hobbs, boy, you just, that would be almost the easiest thing you could be handed as a booker. How, how in the world could I possibly fuck up getting this monster beast over well the answer is quite simple just follow the tony khan playbook times two times two because first wardlow got over on his own and then tony kiboshed it by not knowing what to do about it and then hobbs for a couple of weeks three years into his employment they finally decided to hey we might be able to do something with this guy. And then they put him with QT Marshall to make sure that he didn't get over. Uh, somebody please do a meme of QT's face on an albatross's body. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then now to finish everything off, Tony brings both stories into into an intersection point and finalizes both their careers by putting them against each other to where both of them, either, both the winner and the loser look like shit. In, <sighs> and I, I was afraid this was the least of my fears. It, c- it come to turn out. I was afraid that this could be like a, uh, the match between Bronson Reed and Bobby Lashley, where uh, both power guys so big and strong, it neutralizes the coolest thing about their offense is that they can overpower and throw people around and blah, 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 right? But that was the least of the problems here after I saw the match and the finish that they did. And I, d- I-, I guess they didn't trust them because... 
in this case, both these guys are green at having a match, especially with a guy that matches them size and size and power and power and on television. But instead of trying to construct something that would, again, be easy enough to do that they could pull it off at an execution level of 10 out of 10 and a bit of a story that established the baby face and the heel. I called one between Lashley and Reed. I'm not going to do it again step by step, but something along that line where you established who's the baby face and who's the heel and potentially do something early in the match that Arn Anderson prevents QT Marshall from trying to pull somebody's leg and trip him or just do something innocuous just to establish Arn's presence and gets a pop from the people that takes some of the burden off of the participants from having to just go back and forth. Instead of building any of this and making sure because they can't go long enough to have an epic that this is a match you should not go to break in, start it out, tell the story, get to the payoff, boom. They didn't do any of those things. At the start of the match, Powerhouse Hobbs gave Wardlow three belly-to-belly -belly suplexes. It you, was ma his... you make it sound better than it looked. But no, but that was his first offense. I mean, they were... Somebody's going to say, well, they were sloppy because he was so big. Well, the point is, how, why, or how? If you have a giant fighting a giant, do you establish first thing that one, either of the giants can pick the other one up and throw him to the ground effortlessly three times in a row? And the fact that the person thrown three times in a row didn't sell it made it even worse. It, 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 and then they rolled out to the floor. And they had a fight on the floor and over the rail and went into the arena and they were doing the walk fighting like Brody and uh, Abdullah the Butcher in Japan. Because I'm sure they've all watched those goddamn... Instead of their Mid-South wrestling, they're watching Japanese uh, highlights. And within a minute, they went to the break. But I was so curious because <laughs> both these guys could be attractions in their own way if not for the mismanagement they've undergone. I think it may be, at this point, we may just close the book on both of them. But I watched in the picture in picture. They were on the floor from the time they left before we went to the break until the time they were both back in the ring, two minutes and 30 seconds. For the people in the building, they just either wallowed around, laid and sold, or fought on the floor with the referee just following them around for two and a half minutes. The visual had to be ridiculous to the people in the building. And they didn't even try to have a match. They just did that. And when they came back, they were in the ring, which was worse because they started out with goddamn belly-to-belly -belly overhead suplexes, and now they're just in the fucking ring. Ever they've gone all around the arena. They're, they're, they've started fucking by coming and ended up kissing each other on the cheek. Which one's the baby face, which is the heel? Well, Powerhouse Hobbs makes mean faces, but as far as the style of work or the moves that they did to each other, there was no difference. They did a sloppy yay-boo with clotheslines that didn't do either guy any favors. Then going into a, the finish, they started trying to do drop-behinds and reversals and... Uh, working with back and forth stuff like they were 200 pounds a piece, which is horrible. And no, no. Yes, Wardlow can do his, his swanton or whatever, but there, there should be scoop slam drop behind. Oh, duck this. Get this fucking reverse the arm. What the fuck are you people doing? And there's no training program, apparently. Or are they not listening? Are there no prisons, no workhouses, I ask again, nevertheless. So then finally, Wardlow just decks Hobbs some kind of way, and the girl gets up on the apron and starts doing the fucking 
cartoonish enticing thing. Where did they <laughs> where did they get this woman from? Has she ever even seen television? It was so stagey acting. She lifting up her tanned leg in her short skirt and she's doing the enticing thing. And of course, apparently Wardlow's fucking never seen a woman before because he's fighting this goddamn giant fucking <laughs> California gang, street gang member, whatever the fuck Hobbs' background is supposed to be, and he's just standing there transfixed by her leg. Hey, I can give you five different sights you can see more than her leg, and somebody won't be fucking beating you in the face while you're doing it, unless you're Tony Atlas, in which case make it six sights, but nevertheless. So then Arn gets up on the apron and starts staring at the girl also. He's supposed to be playing chess. But he looks like he'd rather be playing Sticky Finger. And then he starts showing some leg. And then, yes, and then when he <laughs> raised his leg. But no, but he's... Why was it... He should have... If it was Arn Anderson, the enforcer, he should have jerked her off the apron of the ring and carried her to the back, right? But instead, he's standing there, so the referee is staring at Arn, staring at the girl on the apron, while QT rolls in and gives Wardlow a... Cutie cutter, I guess, is what it is. Hey, you forgot ineffective babyface manager Arn Anderson. That was well, what that, the first run was. That's what I'm saying. Why would you have if Arn standing there staring slack jawed at this douchebag while the referee stares slack jawed at Arn while everybody staring slack jawed? The Arn Anderson, the enforcer, is is helping distract the referee. While QT rolls in on the other side and gives Hobbs a cutie cutter, as I said, and and then rolls out. And Arn does nothing about the girl, gets down. Girl gets down, referee turns around, and Hobbs hits a spine buster and gets a two count. And then QT rolls back into the ring and gets in the referee's face, arguing that it should have been a three count. That's a DQ! As a manager, I've done that finish in the past. The referee turns around, sees the manager in the ring. That's a disqualification. Has been since the dawn of recorded wrestling time. But no, now the referee's arguing with QT in the ring. So now Arn comes in. And the referee stands and looks at both of them. There's no DQ, no disqualification of anybody. And Arn confronts QT. And then pulls an invisible gun out of his tracksuit, points his finger at QT, and QT shits his pants and jumps out of the ring. Yes, at the finger gun. At the finger gun. And <laughs> this is a guy who's, it's been, I'm not saying he is, is a successful one, but he's been presented as a professional wrestler. He just bailed out of the ring in fear of a finger gun. But then as he's in the alleyway behind him, for whatever reason, comes Penthouse and his interpreter, Alex, who super kick QT. And instead of going down... And again, why? Super, why? <laughs> And instead of going down from the super kick, QT spins around and walks to the ring and staggers and rolls into the ring and stands up so that Arn can DDT him. And the referee is seeing all of this. The DDT was amazing. If you noticed it, Arn hits him with the DDT and then they both sell it the same way. As soon as QT and Arn hit the mat, they both just immediately roll out of the ring at yes. the exact same time. So QT doesn't sell it. He just rolls just like they were did. supposed to. Because because but remember, there's still a match going on. <laughs> but for the TNT, what is this fucking thing? The TNT, TNT title. TNT title. It's a title match. There's still a match going on after we've had the girl and Arn with the finger gun and QT and Penthouse and Alex came out for moral support with Penthouse. Maybe they were handcuffed together. Maybe that's where they got the handcuffs later. Anyway, after all this has gone on right in front of the referee, then Hobbs and fucking Wardlow start wrestling again. 
And the first thing Hobbs does is schoolboy Wardlow for a two count. Hobbs using a schoolboy. And then Hobbs stands up after that two count where he was in control. He stands up, turns around, and runs at Wardlow and puts his hands on Wardlow's shoulders and just on his own volition vaults up into Wardlow's arms so Wardlow can powerbomb him. Out of the blue, he schoolboys him, stands up, runs at him, vaults up into his arms, and gets powerbombed. And then, to make sure that Powerhouse Hobbs never draws a dime in this business, never draws 15 cents in Chinese money, never draws money if you dipped him in glue and drug him through Fort Knox, cannot draw any money if you gave him paper and green crayons. Wardlow then power bombs him a second time and then leads the fans in singing the ah for the power bomb symphony and then power bombs Hobbs a third time and beats him flat in the middle of the ring. Well, he pinned him the way Rhea Ripley pins one of the small women where she bends her in half almost like she's fucking her. Yes. It, w- it wasn't exactly that way now that I think about it, but it was a dominating pin over Hobbs. Well, at that point, I mean, the cause was lost anyway. Hobbs was dead. Call the time of death. He should have pissed in his mouth while he was down there. That's the only other thing he could have done. A rotten match with a ridiculous finish. Hobbs is done as an attraction. He never got a chance. And the bad thing is, they put a belt on him and somehow made it made him more meaningless after he won the title than he was before he did because of the way that they put it on him and then they take it off of him in three weeks because it's the other guy's hometown. You know, the only guy, it's crazy to say this, the only guy that did it right with the TNT title was Miro. He had a run where he beat people. He was a monster. And then he lost it. We never saw him again. And he started. No, we did see him because he had those vignettes where he was fighting with God in like a white room. Yes, he was. He was mad at God for the longest time. And apparently God won. <laughs> He's never come back. We've never seen him again. He was smited. But they've now this TNT title just trades back and forth like it's the USWA. No, no, I, I beg to differ. You caught me in mid sip there, but I beg to differ because the guys trading the belts back in the, and forth in the USWA, they were over first before they got in the title match. Hopefully this is the end of Hobbs with QT. This QT stuff. It's the end of Hobbs. Why? The best thing they could do if he wants to be a wrestler at this point for a career is give him his release and let him go to a quality, if he can find one, quality training program. Maybe call up Mike Mondo and get some quality training in the psychology of a wrestling match and how to work as a fucking powerhouse. And then, if I was him, I would do everything I could to get a tryout for NXT while he's still young enough and can do this and and is not, unfortunately, learning any more bad habits. Like, if they sold this to him as somehow this was acceptable for his career the thing with qt and the miscellaneous woman the put the belt on him and take it off of him the wait three years to do anything with this fucking guy to begin with and then he gets a three-week doom to failure opportunity and then you beat him like this with Wardlow, who they botched everything with, and now when you hear him do a promo, it's like listening to Bob Backlund. Just he's so, oh, it's so nice to be here and everything. Well, and see, but the thing is, when he got so, when Wardlow, too many pronouns, when Wardlow got so over with the audience, they they knew before we knew that he couldn't fucking talk. They should have never let him start talking. Giving, it, well, I was going to say giving him a mouthpiece isn't the worst thing, even though he's now been exposed a little bit, but... No, no, not even a mouthpiece. If I'm saying he was popular. He should have been switched babyface. He was switched in a manner of speaking. Babyface. 
But in, then he got, remember, he got in a feud with a fake lawyer and goddamn 20 miscellaneous fake security guards. That's right. That was the first thing he did after he won the title. He was ready-made. Get him in something interesting with a fucking slimy heel, and the heel has a friend, and one or both of them can talk, and you wouldn't have goddamn needed. You would have had a two-on-one situation in a lot of cases, which <clears throat> would have kept his explosiveness and given him a reason to sell. You could hear from him very seldom and only a fucking shouted sentence or two at a time that would have you fed him ahead of time that would have kept up his man a few words intensity and, he, and he'd be power bombing job guys on tv every week or two well where i was going was if you're going to give him a mouthpiece right now which i think he needs more than doing any promos by himself or you just have him do no promos obviously to use arn anderson here no disrespect to arn because i've always been an arn fan and he could still talk obviously but based on everything we've seen since the start of aew and no disrespect to you although in a sense i feel the same way should we be seeing 60-plus-year-old managers who really can't do what managers do, let alone no. babyface ones at ringside who are going to be completely ineffective? No, no. And that's, uh, that's it, uh, another point is that Arn didn't do anything before. They didn't have him. They didn't instruct him to do anything or give him anything really meaty to do. But at the same time, being in a babyface's corner, the only reason you should be in a baby face's corner is to counteract someone in the heel corner. And if you are to the point where, except in extreme cases of, and depending on what the big name is, there could be an exception to this rule. But if you're not capable as the, the person in the baby face corner of either getting a shit kicked out of you when the time comes and it's right, or kicking the shit out of the other guy, at least strategically at the big moment when it's called for, you shouldn't be there. And I could understand doing a thing where he trains with Arn or he gets pointers from Arn, but Arn shouldn't be in his corner full time because, and then you've got, again, you don't want someone necessarily to talk for a baby face unless the baby face is gimmick because he doesn't speak the language or he doesn't speak really at all but you don't want somebody talking for the baby face you want the baby face to speak for himself you want somebody speaking potentially for a heel it just it uh, and tully tully did nothing for FTR. Tully did nothing and and he did nothing and but physically again he had the he had a match he didn't do too bad, considering, but he was in his 60s, but Tully had been not doing interviews for 30 fucking years. He didn't really, did you remember, you remember great Tully Blanchard interviews from the 80s, but not from two years ago. That's right. So, it, it, no, and that's, again, that's what I've said before. I've, you know, I don't want to manage anybody right now, but I can't if I did. Because I ain't going to take any fucking bumps. And that's part of it. Anyway, both these guys, Brian, at one point, their futures were so bright, they ought to have been wearing shades. But right now, they're wearing shrouds because their futures are looking very, very dim. Well, but let's folks, tell everyone about Shroudy Ray. Well, if let me just say this. <laughs> if you don't work for Tony Khan, then your future could be brighter than Wardlow's and Hobbs and you would still need the shades instead of the shrouds and that's where shady rays come in because you know you could put shady rays on a shroud on a corpse and then it would look like weekend at Bernie's so I don't know where we can go any further with that but shady rays well at, so I guess some people if you have kind of a wild life maybe at the funeral you be buried with your favorite sunglasses that's not outrageous or I would thought you were going to say everybody should wear sunglasses to the funeral so you can't really tell whether they're upset or not. Was Just Ray takes... Charles buried in his glasses? I don't know. What about Stevie Wonder? He's alive. Well, and that would be disturbing if he'd been buried with sunglasses. And some people think he's not really blind. Oh, come on now. He couldn't work for 60 years straight. But folks, you're wondering what this all has to do with Shady Rays, and so am I. 
And that's why I'm going to get back to this because Shady Rays are people. It's a company actually, but it's composed of people because companies are just people too. That makes high quality sunglasses that are just as gall darn good, or in my opinion, and others as well, even better than the expensive ones and at a fraction of the price. They're durable, they're stylish, they're, t they're timeless, they're on point. They're all of these things. And the best part about them is you can't break them. I don't know why you'd want to try to just break your Shady Rays, but if you do break them, then they'll replace them. Because they're not only durable, but they're fair to you. And if you lose the pair, if you lose the pair and you can't spare another pair because you've lost them, they will replace them. So they even make up for your incompetence. And I think that's a lot to ask for somebody. A, a company of Shady Ray's eminent qualifications to have to make up for your incompetence for your and shadiness. irresponsibility. For your shadiness. They're, for your shadiness. They're Ray's for the shady. Here's another thing. They give you 30 days to try them out, and if you don't like them, you can exchange them or return them for free. So now let's get this straight. Here, first of all, you've got, you've got sunglasses that are durable. They're almost unbreakable. But if you do break them, they'll replace them for you for free. And if you lose them, even through your own stupidity or carelessness or childishness, they'll replace them for free. And if you don't like them after 30 days, they'll change them or return your money for free. And I know what you're saying. Now you're saying, how in the world are these people still in business? I'm wondering the same thing because they're way too honest and fair. But even further, Brian, right now for a limited time only, you can buy one pair of Shady Rays and get a second pair free. And then if you break or lose both of those, why then, my God, by extrapolating that down the line, somebody out there could potentially get 745,000 pairs of Shady Rays for the price of one. I'm pretty sure they would put their foot down and change the policy before things got that out of hand. Well, if you only want 177,000 pairs of Shady Rays for the price of one, folks, act now. Go to ShadyRays.com. That's S-H-A-D-Y-R-A-Y-S.com slash J-C-E. Use the code J-C-E. And as we said, for a limited time, you buy one pair of Shady Rays, you're going to get a second pair for free. And that way you can protect yourself from being out in the sunny places. If if it's bright sunshine and people are able to get a good look at you, well, put these sunglasses on and then you'll, you'll be impervious. They won't be able to see you. ShadyRays.com slash JCE, code JCE. Get a second pair of Shady Rays free. They'll replace them for free if you break them. They'll replace them if you lose them. Hell, they might just send you five or six pairs just because they're not paying attention. They won't do that. They're just free with these things. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been out in bright sunlight and you said, well, I'm too visible. So you put those sunglasses on and instantly people can't see you. Well, I never thought of it that way, but I will try that with my new Shady Rays. The Shady Rays, they bend the light all around you. Well, what? Yeah, you can just slip right into a, a, light, a light groove and the light bends around. That's how they make people invisible. They bend light around you. Who's they? Well, the, the scientists. The scientists bend light around you. That makes you invisible. If, if something doesn't reflect light, then it can't be seen. So if you just bend the light around the person or thing, then it becomes invisible. That's what Shady Rays do for you. Hmm. Shady Rays. All right, well, speaking of shady people, let's go to Shady Sammy Guevara in the back with Rene Moxley Good. And MJF comes in and makes a deal with Sammy. Brian, can you articulate, based on this interview, the deal that was made? I watched this live last night, and my intention after it was to sit back and let you explain it, and then I would jump in with my thoughts because you would clarify what I saw. <laughs> I can't really. 
Renee's about to do the interview with Sammy, who is baby, both babyface and heel at this point. MJF comes in and he says, in exchange, eventually, in exchange for a check that you could write any figure you want on, a blank check, you have to go and win the match tonight? Was that it? Well, no. <laughs> Not well, that's part of it. But basically, MJF comes in and pitches Sammy should be in the main event of Double or Nothing in the world title match against me. And all you got to do is lay down. And then, ah, oh, Sammy says, I knew there was something. Uh, but the way that they did it, they glossed over that point with the surprise pop of Sammy going, I knew there was a catch to it. And then MJF comes in, but no, no, there's a check also. They never articulated the deal that well, but apparently the story is that MJF will use his influence to try to make sure that it's Sammy Guevara challenging him for the title at double or nothing in the main event and give him the blank check on the theory that Sammy will then lay down for him in the title match. But first, Sammy has to not only beat Jungle Jack tonight, but then he has to go on and next week or whenever that match is, he will have to beat Darby Allen. And then he can be in the main event of the pay-per-view challenging for the title against MJF and get the blank check as long as he lays down and I guess they do the one finger poke of doom or whatever is the story they're trying to tell because why would, why would he fight him and then lay down for him? So that's <laughs> apparently they're trying to make the fans think, Oh my God, MJF is going to give us a fucking fake match. I, I, I don't know. To my earlier point, this felt like a raw backstage segment more than anything we've seen on AEW, really. So again, Sammy and MJF are now going to be friends because the idea is Sammy is going to get into that title match and get all these wonderful benefits by laying down. I guess that's how you set up the four-way if you're going to still do it, right? Is the idea that Oh, please, no, Some at least... Some figure comes out there after he beats Darby and says, this is ridiculous, you guys have already said your attention is for him to lay down for the finger poke of doom. We're not going to have it for a No, 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 no. For God's sake, no. It needs to be Darby against MJF. Darby needs to beat Sammy. But then Sammy will be mad and probably cost Darby the match. But at least we'll get a single match that we can watch instead of a four-way that I'll just fucking skip. So what do you do with Jungle Boy and Sammy on the pay-per-view? Well, again, Sammy would be involved in terms of screwing Darby out of his his opportunity and jungle boy can, I don't know. Do they have enough people selling popcorn? Do they need somebody in the parking lot? Security, whatever. I don't care. With the amount of references that have been made on TV now to Sammy's role as Jericho's flunky in character, the guy to, as he said, take the bumps. I mean, he said that on the promo last time. Do you see this as a way to break him away from Jericho and use him with MJF, or at least in that picture with MJF? Well, it, it doesn't have to be aligned with MJF to have interaction with him. I'm not saying line him up with him like they've suddenly become friends. If the heels use each other from time to time, but it could be used to get Sammy out of the group and make him a single attraction, because if Darby Allen challenges for the world title and loses, even if it's not direct intervention and just a cheap, unimaginative finish, but something that Sammy does creates a handicap or a stumbling block or whatever at the appropriate time that MJF capitalizes on, whatever the case, then you've got a natural Darby versus Sammy return match out of that which can be a program well who might get a title rematch well sammy still wants that blah 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 but that would make sense and stuff uh, but anyway we were at the top of the nine o'clock hour folks that's where if people are flipping by and if maybe if i stall long enough we'll get the ratings it's still so early in the day i don't know <laughs> if we'll get that but 
where you think people are flipping by or changing channel or ending a previous program, you want to put the star power out. We talk about the top of the hour on Raw or SmackDown every week. Well, the top of the hour at 9 o'clock that they decided to show us was J. Switchblade White versus Commander. And an unknown guy that's only just debuted in the company, what, two weeks ago or whatever, last week, against, a, for all intents and visual purposes, a Mexican mini. I don't know if this guy is Russian, Hispanic, Chinese, or Indonesian, but he's dressed like a luchador, and he's five foot three and, weigh, and is introduced at 160 pounds. And Jay White, again, I watched this match because I wanted to see what all the fuss is about. Everybody, Jay White, Jay White. It was a big deal to a lot of the AEW fans. They signed him. So I'm okay. It was a great idea for him to sell for this guy for the whole fucking match. Well, that's why I wanted to, okay, here's the first match that this new star that they've signed, this hot free agent, so what makes him a star? What what do I what am I supposed to care about? What does he do? How does he conduct himself? Whatever. Well, what I saw was a guy getting his ass kicked by a kid in a mask. Or sometimes he turned into a guy standing around waiting to catch a cheerleader in a vaulting routine. He's in shape, Jay White, I'm talking about. He looks athletic. He's got a nice visual look. His his wrestling, his shit didn't look bad. His offense, what? It, but every every time he had to cooperate with the aggressive parkour, or the fact that for the majority of this match, I was watching this dwarf kick the shit out of this guy. There was nothing done to get Jay White over as a star here, or to even tell you that he was supposed to be a star, except the announcers saying it while he was getting his ass kicked by an unknown midget. And the big spot in the match <laughs> they built to was the jobber doing the tightrope walk. <laughs> what what, I'm, what I'm am sorry, I talking about? <laughs> just, just the way you run through it, just, uh, it's amazing. He got, <laughs> a, a Commander got two big false finishes, two big two counts, then got a submission hold on him, the uh, like a standing octopus, and then okay, it's time to go home. Jay White just grabbed him and hit what I assume is his finish twice. Hit him with it once, pick him up, hit him with it again, and pinned him by the skin of his teeth. And what the fuck kind of debut is that for a, a guy that's allegedly going to be okay? <laughs> I can see him now, you know, being competitive with El Fuego del Sol or, you know, any of the other guys they have on the roster that are 150 pounds or less. Well, except for Darby Allen. Darby Allen probably kicked the shit out of this guy. Because what the, f what in the world kind of debut is, and then Juice Robinson's in his corner and somehow, here's a name from the distant past, Sean Spears is shown numerous times in the front row watching this match for what reason I'm still in the dark about. And they just go out and pull Sean Spears over the rail and, and the heels beat him up barely until here comes Ricky Starks and he hits and makes the save. So the Bullet Club... Jay White and Juice Robinson, they debut together. Jay White has a match. He barely beats a dwarf. He does an angle with Sean Spears, and then they get run off by one fucking guy. This guy looks like a fucking threat to any championship to me. What about you, Brian? We saw Commander, I think, last week because we saw a lot of these tightrope act. I remember you and I talking yeah, about it. We yeah. saw a lot of this stuff. And on its own, in a vacuum in a fucking big top, whatever, it's impressive. But when you've seen it now two weeks in a row, and you can tell this guy needs to get his balance, and he's, the, the one spot, I mean, now people have isolated it, where he has Jay White's arm, and he's just jumping from the middle rope to the top rope to the middle yes. rope to the top rope. 
Yes. Why doesn't Jay White yank this motherfucker off the rope? Jay White just stands there and lets this happen. Jay White could have yanked him at any time. He's standing there transfixed by the scene unfolding in front of him, forgetting that the guy's got a hold of his fucking arm. I thought when this match started, because we saw Commander and we saw what his routine is last week, what an interesting way Tony's going to get Jay White over on his debut here. He's coming out there. Oh, he has Juice Robinson with him. All right, even better. This moon dog is going to cheat to help the heel beat the really small guy. Okay, that works. They established who he was last week. They just have to screw him out of one of those tightrope spots and people will start booing and then you beat him. And then he got competitive. Not even competitive. Jay White sold the whole match as a heel. I think he's a heel. As a heel. With another heel at ringside in his corner, he just let this guy run circles around him until the very end. Sean Spears and uh, Juice Robinson. Again, I don't know. They bring in people in the weirdest ways. They bring in people and then immediately mix them with, at least I think, the wrong people to get the audience interested in. I don't know what they're doing with this. Who are we pushing? Is it common the thing that I would scream back in the Ring of Honor days, and it's gotten worse. You know what's crazy? This show has not been very good, and that is another gardener going in the background, a whole unique, different crew. But up until this point, this is how the booking has treated him. I hadn't even thought about Ricky Starks. Where's Ricky Starks? When's he going to come out there? It surprised me when his music hit. Oh, shit, Ricky Starks works here. <laughs> well, he got beat up last week. Yeah, but see that's... how many people got beat up last week. People get beat up in every, every fucking segment. segment. Yeah. On this episode, especially. Well, speaking of which, um, here's another ball that was dropped. Uh, remember when Mark Briscoe could have been pushed to the moon and would have easily been bought by the AEW fans as a top singles guy and would have been most popular guy in a promotion if it was... A, Every week, something was done right after the initial thing, and that's all been, all that momentum has been lost, and FTR is standing there. They've just signed a new contract, apparently, and I, I guess they, you know, hey, it's great to be able to spend time at home with the family. That's what they've got here, and they're in the back with Renee Moxley Good. And she not only tells them this information, but then says, well, here, watch it on this screen right behind me. And they show a VTR of Mark Briscoe being attacked earlier in the day. And this is the first FTR has heard about it, and they're shocked, and they run off 30 feet to the fucking trainer's room where there's Mark being worked on by the doctors. So... <laughs> Apparently, they had their Raycon wireless earbuds in. I wish Raycon was on the program today. What a transition. And by the way, Mark seemed fine. Mark seemed fine. He was sitting, there <laughs> sitting up. Not a, no bandages, not any blood. He said, I'm okay. I'm ready to go. But the doctor or whoever is saying, no, no, you can't. And here's where it got complicated. Because now there is... Mark Briscoe sitting there with the trainer or the doctor, whoever, Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, Jeff Jarrett, and Zippy the Giant Pinhead are in the room. And then there's FTR on the other side of the room, and Mark says he's fine, but the doctor won't let him wrestle. So Mark wants FTR to team with Jarrett and Lethal. And I wrote, what is happening? And we find out this is a match that's going to be on Rampage, not even in this program. Not even the normal Rampage day. But but besides that, even if Mark ain't okay right now, he might be okay by Friday or Saturday. But there's, And because Mark is out, he wants these two guys to take his place, teaming with Jeff Jarrett and Lethal in what we now understand is an eight-man tag. Well, who was going to be the third partner on Mark Briscoe's side anyway and why was mark briscoe teaming with heels like jeff jarrett and jay lethal and what the fuck is going on i have no answers for you other than uh the gardener that's here now is my gardener it's julio and the boys 
Okay. So I apologize. It's going to get loud, but I don't know. Are, are they going to go down by the schoolyard? You know, we talk about MJF needing people to work with. You're right. There's a period of time that, not that Mark Briscoe wouldn't work in the future, but should have slotted him in there right then and there when they needed someone. Now he's mixed in with the bad comedy of Jay Lethal. I, and I'm sorry to say it, but Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, and that crew, Sanjay and the Giant. Maybe yeah. if they weren't there, it wouldn't be so silly. And now FTR's mixed in with that. So I don't know. Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal without Zippy and Sanjay uh, and and just a, a presentation could be the it would be the best in work in ring working tag team heel team in AEW and would be a great match with FTR. But with all of this falderall and I don't know what the fuck. Well, next up was the long awaited. First time ever face-off between Chris Jericho and Adam Cole. Who's longly awaited it, you might say? Probably Jericho. He's been anxious to sap some of that good Adam Cole fucking adrenochrome. I mean, they, they got in a ring. And this was, I will say, probably the most WWE-style thing. They got in a ring, both of them, with microphones and... Adam Cole, always a fan of Jericho, always had respect for him. They shook hands, and then Jericho says, well, I've got zero respect for you. I think you're an arrogant son of a bitch. And then Adam Cole says, Chris is a jag-off, an insecure, stupid idiot. And Jericho tells him off and says, get out of my ring. And Adam says, what you going to do about it? And Jericho shoves him, and Adam Cole gets on him. And then here we go. And I went through all of that because with this, it wasn't really important what they said, and they did a fine job of what they were doing to set up their argument. Adam Cole's very well-spoken. But here is where they had the idea, the concept of an angle to do that, I mean, you know, maybe, I don't know, Jericho's old enough, he's been around, it's probably been done, that's why maybe he pitched it. He just didn't pay good close attention or there's no quality control to under to ensure that everybody else involved in it understood what the fuck to do or what was going on. That sometimes happens that these guys these days, or Tony as a, a booker with ADD, takes a moment or a thing they remember and and think they know the whole setup to execution of and fall out from a particular kind of angle. In this case, what they wanted to do was a variation on the old, we're going to make the baby face watch as we hurt or punish someone dear to him angle, right? And I mean, that's as old as wrestling. And it it was a, a the, the flavor of that angle was something that Dusty do, Watts would do. Uh, fucking, I've seen it in Tennessee. It's an old time territory angle. And it has many multiple variations because it depends on who's involved. The only thing you really need, the thing you most need, is you have to have a top baby face with an affiliation with, a relationship with someone weaker, lower on the card, younger, more sympathetic, and that's the person that is punished to get at that top baby face. Whether it is a protege, whether it's a child, or a younger brother, or, or even just, you know, a young protege they've taken under the wing, whatever the case. I remember Chief Thundercloud and Danny Little Bear, when they were a team, they were a team for a couple of years. They did this, I think, in Nick's end and, and tennis and Memphis end also. Chief Thundercloud, one of his sons was their drummer boy. Actually, I think he had two sons at various times. One or the other, both of them did it, Chewy and Chato. But anyway, the heels, in this case, I think it was Dutch Mantel and David Schultz, attack and beat up this 15-year-old drummer boy. He's the one that accompanied him to the ring. They were baby faces, but when they'd get in trouble, he would beat on the drum and the fans would make noise and that would spur the Indian to get up and make a comeback. Or, I mean, we stole it uh, and upgraded it, updated it. 
in Smoky Mountain 30 years ago with Jake the Snake and Dirty White Boy. Everybody in Knoxville knew that the Dirty White Boy and the Dirty White Girl, Kim, who had been involved with Continental Wrestling and on programs for years, they were married, for real, together, a couple. So Tony Anthony gets handcuffed to the top rope and Jake the Snake DDTs Dirty White Girl right in the middle of the ring right in front of him. He can't do anything about it. And then, of course, Jake no-shows, and he never did do anything about it. Poor white girl went unavenged. But uh, but th so that angle is old and has been done in every territory uh, over the period of time. They had that idea. The problem was in the execution and because they made it complicated and because, again, I know everybody knows Adam Cole and Britt Baker are together, but unless, and you have the rule that a man can't do something to a woman, especially with a kendo stick. But if you have that, then this was not the place to do this particular angle. Because what they did was when, when Jericho gets in a fight with Cole, Garcia comes in and they start beating up Adam Cole. And then Britt Baker comes in and pulls Jericho off of Adam Cole and slaps him in the face. And now at that point, if they wanted to do this angle, then honestly, fuck the kendo stick. Jericho should have just put the goddamn walls of Jericho on Brit. Because to oh, they be could honest, have never done that. Well, but think about this. How many Boston crabs have ever been used in a domestic dispute? You're not punching her. You're not hitting her. Scoop the ankles. Turn her over and put a Boston crab on her. Explain to me how the that know. you can't say it without smiling and laughing. I hear it in your voice but right I now. Say, well, I'm I'm more than network say. My advocation is don't do this angle then. But if they'd have had Jericho put her in the Boston crab, that may have been one thing. But nevertheless, here's what happened. Why not hit her with the Judas while he's at it? Well, no, but see, that's a strike. A, a, I a know, scoop I slam. Know. A scoop slam on a... How many times you have a full scoop slam in a fucking domestic dispute? And I've always thought the turning over the knee and spanking if it was a heel girl, but that wouldn't have worked here. But nevertheless, what they did was as soon as Britt slaps Jericho, Soraya, Tony Storm, and Ruby Soso come out from underneath the ring and attack Britt. And they're the ones that then beat Britt. So now he's mixed what's allegedly a top angle, Jericho and Cole, in with the fucking girls program. And besides that, the execution of this, what I'm about to say next, did you see how they handcuffed Adam Cole to the bottom rope? And have you ever seen that? Was like he actually handcuffed? Because it looked to me like he was holding the rope that he could have gotten up at any time. Was he handcuffed? No, no, he was holding the rope because he had no choice because they didn't, they handcuffed him literally to the rope. They had, and those were not handcuffs, those were leg shackles. Oh. And, the, the, well, the reason you can tell the difference is because handcuffs have, a police issue handcuffs have either two or three links of chain in between the cuffs, or elsewise, they don't have any chain. They're those stiff kind that join together, and you can't work with those at all. You can't move in those, your, hand, your hands can't turn, you can't use those for working purposes in wrestling at all. The handcuffs that have two or three lengths of chain in between them are a little awkward, but those are regular police issue handcuffs and you can work with them. But the leg shackles have that foot or 18 inches, well, probably a foot, of chain in between them because you have to walk with those, right? That's why you never find handcuffs that have that much chain in between them. Those are leg shackles. That's first of all. Second of all, what he did was he put Adam Cole's wrist right next to the rope and put one end of the cuffs around both the wrist and the rope. So effectively, Adam Cole was handcuffed to that bottom rope to the point where his hand was in a place where all he could do was fucking hold onto the rope. And that's... Okay, imagine this. When you're going to handcuff somebody to the... Say, handcuff so-and-so to the top rope, 
so that we can do this angle. Well, unless you specifically tell the guy and show the guy how to do it, chances are they're going to fuck it up if they've never done it before or never been told how to do it right. I've seen if somebody take a pair of handcuffs and handcuff one cuff around the wrist, right? And then handcuff the other cuff to the top rope or to one of the ropes. Well, that doesn't work because then the guy can walk the full length of the ring up and down in front of the rope. See what I'm saying? You can slide the handcuff down the rope. And so he still can't get to the middle of the ring, but it's a bad visual because he's not restrained in a specific area. He has too much freedom of movement for the visual you're giving the people to be that he's confined. This, the way that they did it, Cole was down on his knees at the bottom rope and couldn't really move at all, which is too much confinement. And you can't visually give the people the dog at the end of its leash that you want in this. What you want is you want one cuff around the wrist and the other cuff on the top turnbuckle in between the turnbuckle pad and the ring post. Because now, effectively, the guy is immobilized in one six-foot square area but he's got room to panic and freak out and show the people that he's confined. If he, he can't go over the top rope because then he's on the apron. And that doesn't help him. He can't get down to the floor because he doesn't have enough slack. But if he gets in, if he's in the ring, then he can have one arm out, uh, outstretched from the, from the top turnbuckle and the other arm reaching into the middle of the ring, like, oh my God, I can't reach to do anything. And he can pull and tug, but the, the turnbuckle won't come out. And he can try to lean back and throw kicks out to the middle of the ring at the heels that can taunt him because they're a foot away and he can't reach and they see how much slack he's got. And the whole building does too. Do you see where I'm going with this? Th that makes it jeopardy and urgency. The guy has all this room to try and portray that he can't get away and there's a specific line that he can't cross that the heels stay right beyond and taunt him. And then that's just the people involved in this, right? That, that we're talking about the guy that's handcuffed, the, the weak the person that's dear to them, that's down in the, in the middle of the ring and the heels that are beating the shit out of that person. But here's another thing that made this WWE and it was the pace of a glacier. Nobody was coming out. Nobody was trying to help. Um, where was Jericho? Jamie Hayter? Well, yeah, yeah. Where was Jamie Hayter? Where was anybody? Where they've established they've got <laughs> twenty-five security guards at any point. They've got multiple referees. Britt Baker has Jamie Hayter. Even uh, uh, ring crew people, somebody from the crowd. That's the point. The picture that they created, the visual, was lacking. Even if they did one part of the song, the guitar part, they still needed drums and a bass and the fucking synthesizer or whatever. So when Jericho hands Soraya the kendo stick and she's wearing Britt Baker out, yes, Adam Cole was freaking out because he couldn't get there, but he was in that confined, squatted space. And then, you know, and the thing is, when the guy's allowed to be on his feet, handcuffed to the top rope, then you can go in and kick him and put him back down on his knees, and he can sell, but then he can get up, but he can't reach, and blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, nobody was coming out. And I'm it, it, in the territory days, yes, it was easier. I will give them that, because the fans knew there was only eight other baby faces in the building, or they knew there's only two referees for the night, or the promotion didn't have its own security. They used uniformed police officers that didn't get in the ring unless one of the fans did. And the fans had seen that, and they knew that. But it, it, at this point, somebody, Hater, if Hater could have run out, there's three girls in the ring, plus there's the Jericho heels. One of the girls wipes Hater out, plays King of the Hill. But maybe also, you bring a couple of referees out. 
and they're trying to help and they're trying to get around the guy that's handcuffed but the fuck it there's a kendo stick in the ring one of the heels takes kendo stick and is reaching over the the top rope and smacking away at the referees in the territory days a lot of times you would have the guy that was known as being the ring crew guy he'd come and he'd get up on the ring apron and try to start unscrewing the top turnbuckle so that it could come out so the cuff could be switched off or slipped off but the heels would would keep him away and they'd play king of the hill with anybody else trying to come in as the bell was ringing and the baby faces underneath on the you know on the card they are coming back out maybe a main event guy doesn't come out until after it's all over with and then he runs out with one boot on or shower shoes on and and shampoo in his hair to explain why that he didn't come out and make the save because he had just wrestled and was in the shower when all this went going on and through all of that chaos and urgency being portrayed at ringside and if a guy was tied in the ropes instead of cuffed then i've done this finish and i've seen it before you'd send the ring crew guy to go under the ring with and get in the toolbox and either come out with bolt cutters or a fucking knife and cut the rope or cut the fucking cuffs but it would be too late because the heels were urgently doing this after taunting the baby face when they see people coming out and trying to intervene and they're starting to knock them off then they get their business done and then somehow that one baby face that's been trapped gets loose or too many people come in the ring and the heels bail with no contact so they leave with their heat but they don't just finish what they're doing like they did here and just stroll off with nobody ever having tried to hinder their fucking criminality so this was just part of an angle that somebody remembered somebody telling the story of, but nobody knew how to execute the fucking thing to where it had any impact and made any difference or looked any different than anything else. Does what I said just make any sense? It makes a lot of sense. Cole looks so weak, just sitting there holding the rope while he's, as you're saying, cuffed to it, but it looked, because you see the giant chain and the other cuff on the ground, Looked like he was just holding the rope. Yeah. And he's saying, please let her go. Let her go. Who's he saying that to? Jericho or the girls? <laughs> like, it was just, it was a situation. He had no power over anyone. It was a situation that it was no way to make it work well, I don't think. And there goes Julio and everyone right behind me. This wasn't uh, necessarily done, I think, too well. Now, to be honest... There are a lot of fans who think this was really great, that it was well done, that this is going to really make people want to see Adam Cole get his hands on Chris Jericho, and I guess Britt Baker get her hands on the outcasts. What do you think of that argument? Well, again, they've, they've mixed a main event singles level program with Cole and Jericho in with the girls' angle. And how's that? Are they going to have a fucking eight or ten person with a couple of Jericho's guys and the... Ruby Soso and Tony Storm against Britt and Hater and Cole and whoever the nah, fuck. No. Mixed match. It'll be Jericho and Soraya against Britt and Cole. Oh my God. And see, that's going to be rotten. And so they, they decided they were going to do this and then they put everybody else into it that they had to put into it and they watered it down and they didn't know how to execute and nobody's probably ever seen it before done live in person properly and if people liked it well imagine what they would have thought if they'd have seen it done properly in person before they saw this hey once again you know you want to give someone a chance this is the second time they've debuted adam cole and i'm so unimpressed with everything they've done with him and he looks weak and i know there are people that watch that reality show that say if you watch that Cole and Britt come off like the biggest, especially Cole, like the biggest baby faces. There are people that don't think Britt came off well, but I've, I've had people, people tell me that if you want to hate Britt Baker, watch that program and you will hate her by the time it's over with. Well, I've also heard some people think the other way. Other people think Sammy Guevara comes across as very sweet and charming on that show. I mean, a lot of people have different thoughts about it, but I don't like the way they're using Adam Cole. And again, he's another one of these guys that Tony Khan loves maybe more than most wrestling fans would. But I guess the point is, before we move on quickly, um, when they try to redo these angles from the past and nobody has 
the context on what instigated them, how they were done, how exactly they're executed, how everybody needs to play their part and what comes out of it. You just, it's like when shit stain you, he remembered Piper hitting snooker with the coconut. And so he, he wanted to do moments of people getting hit with coconuts without any of the context that made it memorable and the talent that made it memorable. But that, and, and that's something I used to, again, go over ga with guys in OVW, especially when we were training people from scratch on how to do these things. And guys got practice, not in how to be the integral parts of the angle, but in how to be the support and the fill for the angle, the guys running out, the guys getting knocked off the apron, the guy coming out with the fucking bolt cutters, the staggered timing of the run-ins to where everybody was accounted for and reasonably busy and i would ask guys when they come to me with finishes i'd say okay give me the finish you want to do bing 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 okay where's where's brian he's not accounted for oh he got drop kicked well he got drop kicked between 45 seconds and a minute ago so where is he now because he wouldn't sell that for a minute and make sure that every nobody ends up with their dick in their hand standing around in the way or obviously not having anything to do when they could be doing something if they wanted to. They could, if they're not supposed to help the situation, but they have an obvious opportunity, then they have not either been taken care of in the finish to be placed in the right place or known how to take care of themselves to not be caught in that predicament. And you always want to teach guys, where are you? And none of this... This was not allowed the hiding underneath the ring or at ringside or just sitting around until your cue. You had to have something to do to keep you busy in a natural way for every second that you were in view of the people in the arena, TV or not, or you got yelled at. Because it's one take and it's fucking live and we don't do bullshit. And now people just run in or don't run in intermittently with no reason, no purpose. And, and if, if they're not needed for a spot for the next couple minutes, they are allowed to just roll out on the floor and lay around for a while in full view of the people. Fuck all of that. So anyway, bad training. Bad training and improper agenting and producing. And probably a good deal of not listening comes into all of this moving on jake hager cool hand luke and daddy mac mac daddy against the acclaimed and billy gunn and i don't know what caster said but it's the first time i've ever heard them bleep his rap or blap his reap they bleeped his rap the heels jumped the baby faces before the bell they went a minute and they went to the break they came back immediately gave a tag to billy gunn he made a comeback they stopped him Cool Hand Luke hit his partner Mac Daddy by mistake with his comb. And then Billy Gunn broke Cool Hand Luke's comb, which was the biggest pop of the match, I think. And then Acclaimed hit their finish, one, two, three. Now they've just... The people like the Acclaimed so much that Tony feels like he, they have to see them but he has nothing for them to do, so they do this. Any comments? Can they add too much to that? I don't think anyone really wanted to see this as much as they wanted to see the acclaimed. Like he said, Caster got a nice pop for the tag at the end to do his uh, elbow drop. You know, I think you got to do something different with them now. They got over with the scissor me ass daddy. How long do you ride that now? Well, the thing is that what they, is they, they can, daddy ask? Scissor me ass daddy. <laughs> Scissor me timbers. Um, <laughs> you can still do that for, because as long as the people like it, but if they were involved with or doing something else besides that. They're becoming only to, that, I guess, is the yes, problem. Yeah, because that's all. And he's got no other tag teams. And the tag teams that he did have are now three-man team so they can go for the evp six-man tag team fetish title and it, 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 
He just he he didn't he didn't know. Tony didn't know what to do with him after they got over, so he decided I won't do anything. And plus, as we said, he had a green tag team that he had no choice but to put in with other green teams, and I think that hurt him. And he had no choice because he won't use teams unless they're green. It's not Let's easy. Let's get being to the green. main event. It's not easy being green. Boy, howdy. Um, speaking of greenery, the main event of the evening, winner will go on to face Darby Allen. The winner of that gets MJF. MJF has given Sammy a blank check to win this thing and then lay down for him in the main event of the pay-per-view, which if people thought that's what they were actually going to see, they wouldn't buy it. So we know that. Uh, but anyway, um, at the bell between Sammy Guevara and Jungle Jack Boy Perry, Jungle Boy drop kicked Sammy straight to the floor and hit a dive five seconds in, threw Sammy back in the ring, and Sammy jumped up and dove out on Jungle Boy five seconds later. And then Sammy <laughs> threw Jungle Boy in the ring and jumped up on the apron and stood there so that Jungle Boy could run all the way across the ring, jump over the top rope, put his legs around Sammy's head and Hurricane Rana him off to the floor. And then Jungle Boy threw Sammy in and Sammy sold nothing and ended up hitting a Spanish fly off the top rope, which in case, like most people, you don't know what the fuck a Spanish fly is. They both get up on the top rope together and one of them at the, well, both of them at the same time with obvious cooperation one of them does a backflip while holding the other guy that's doing a forward flip, and they land in the middle of the ring. And that was the first five moves of the match. And I wrote at that point, I don't know if I can take any more. And they went back to the apron, and they did some contrived apron parkour where they kept flipping and still landing on the apron without really doing anything while the referee stared slack-jawed and mouth agape at what was going on. And then S Sammy hit the aforementioned Spanish fly, but instead of off the top rope into the ring, he hit it off the apron onto the floor. <laughs> so that means they both took a fucking big fucking flipping bump off the apron of the ring onto the fucking floor, and that was just the break spot. And when they came back, they were actually in the ring. So, of course, another case of starting out with the German gangbang porn and then finishing up with the Showtime R-rated flick, they're back in the ring trying to wrestle. And I fast-forwarded that shit match where I saw a bunch more flips and big moves that nobody was selling. And then finally... The finish was that Sammy drop kicked Jungle Boy off the top rope. I don't know if he was supposed to go through the table. It actually looked better that he didn't for once because instead of breaking a table, it looked like he actually hit something hard that could have damaged him. But Jungle Boy flies off the top rope after the drop kick, hits one of the ringside tables, boom, with his upper body and bounces off on the floor. And the referee starts the count. And you think, okay, you would buy the count out, right? But instead, at eight, Jungle Boy is up, and he's going to get back in the ring, and Sammy draws the referee, and there's MJF appears from behind him, spins him around, got the diamond ring, boom, knocks him goofy with the ring, and then bails and disappears, and Jungle Boy is counted out. And again, count out, finish, that was fine. It would have worked with the fucking dropkick off the top. I know that wasn't the story, but how the fuck this they get up after everything you can't do an angle anymore because nothing conceivably can hurt these people um and that so at least now jungle boy's out of it as he should be and hopefully next week or whenever this match is they'll do the right thing darby will beat sammy honestly fairly somehow and resourcefully at least and then our title match at the pay-per-view will be darby allen versus mjf 
And, you know, then Sammy can be involved, whatever, but hopefully Jungle Boy is out of this picture. He's just dragging the thing down. The fact that Jungle Boy lost via countout makes me think that they're not going to... There's no way that's the end of this story. So he is either going to be figured into the match or just him and Sammy is something separate. I'm not really clamoring for him and Sammy again. <sighs> so that's, again, I, that's why I think they're going to put him in that match. Well, I agree with you. You're right, or else why they would have just beat him. But we can hope, can't we? Uh, but that was dynamite. And if brains were gasoline, the booker couldn't blow his nose. That was indeed another episode of Dynamite. You want to talk about the ratings? Have, wait, have they come in? Have we, have we diddled around long enough that the ratings have come in? They've escaped. I don't know if we They've want to say that. They've escaped. Well, and I got some big news over here, maybe affecting uh, uh, Castle Cornet and all of the occupants as well. So let's do the ratings, and then oh. I'll fill you in on that. I hope everything's all right, but let's do these ratings. This week, as I said, April 19th, AEW Dynamite on TBS, 830,000 viewers. Ouch. That would, Now, they've been in the eights. We've had a lot of eights lately. And I, I think I said last week that may be where they're at as far as with no big competition and no big stars. They're kind of, that's the base audience, right? But now they've, they've lost a few. It was higher eights instead of lower eights. This was the lowest total viewership since February 15th. Well, so after Valentine's Day. I don't know what that has to do with anything. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but. So a, lot of, a lot of the viewers gave them the kiss off. I guess so. Let's get the quarter hour breakdowns, Jim. The first quarter of this week, segment one, 8 to 8, 15 p.m. The Jack Perry, Darby Allen, Sammy Guevara, MJF live promo segment, 963,000 viewers. Okay, you know what? This is starting to concern me. Is the bottom falling out of the Big Bang Theory market? Last week was 919. Yeah, well, they always had over a million to start with because of the big bangers uh, until here just recently. I'm I'm worried. Maybe everybody's seen every episode of that show for the ninth time. So uh, go ahead. That's the worst show. But anyway, oh, by the way, these uh, were compiled by WrestleNomics. Quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m. Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter versus The Outcasts with Picture in Picture. 853,000 viewers. Ouch! Okay, now, just judging from their overall average, some people have to come back <laughs> after that is over. If, if, if they feel like it's safe to return to the television after the girls' match is over, because that was a drop of 110,000 people in the first half hour. And by the way, for comparison's sake, last week went from 919 to 901. So not as big a drop, obviously. The third segment, the third quarter, segment three, 830 to 845 p.m. The finish of the aforementioned Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter versus the Outcast match. The Wardlow and Arn Anderson backstage interview. Kenny Omega and Brian Danielson's live promo slash angle with the Blackpool Combat Club and the Elite as well as Takeshita, 869,000 viewers. Okay, so they picked up uh, 16,000 out of the 110,000 that they lost previously. The fourth quarter, 8.45 to 9 p.m., Powerhouse Hobbs versus Wardlow with Picture in Picture, the post-match with Christian Cage and Luchasaurus, and the Sammy Guevara MJF backstage promo. It'd be best for Hobbs' career if there had been a massive power outage on the East Coast and all of California, but go ahead. 846,000 viewers. Oh, uh, well, at least there's 23,000 people that didn't see that thing that uh, might buy Hobbs another day. So yeah, so they backed down another 23,000. And that's not too far off last week. Last week was 854,000 viewers for that segment. And that was Orange Cassidy versus Buddy Matthews. It just took them a little bit longer last week to get down that far. Segment five, the nine o'clock hour, nine to nine fifteen PM. Jay White versus commander with picture in picture. 
the post-match with Juice Robinson, Ricky Starks, and Sean Spears, 791,000 viewers. Ouch. Okay, there goes another rubber tree plant. There goes 46 and 9 is 55,000 more people. The next segment, segment six. Uh, yes, the next segment, segment six. The FTR, Mark Briscoe, Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett backstage promo and angle, <laughs> as well as the Chris Jericho, Adam Cole live promo and the angle with Daniel Garcia, Britt Baker, and the outcasts, and the handcuffs, I guess we should say. And the handcuffs. 792,000 viewers. Oh, boy. Well, let's just call that flat. Is that within the statistical margin of error? They, got, they, they picked up 1,000 people. Segment seven, Matt Hardy's backstage promo, oh, excuse me, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., Matt Hardy's backstage promo and the acclaimed and Billy Gunn versus the Jericho Appreciation Society with picture in picture, 761,000 viewers. And there goes another 31,000. So do you think the people now have just, there is no hope. At least we can beat the traffic from the couch to our bedroom. Well, we'll find out if they beat it here. The last segment, segment eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m. Sammy Guevara versus Jungle Boy Jack Perry with Picture in Picture and the post-match with MJF and Darby Allen. And something that was talked about through the course of the show more often than not since they had that set up at the beginning. If you weren't sick of them after that whole beginning thing, <laughs> 762,000 viewers. Oh, you're ribbon. Okay, well, they got a thousand people. Have all both of their immediate families and their in-laws, basically. So, oh, Jungle Jack and who ha who dad are up? So, ye. So, that's two hundred thousand people it, that they hemorrhaged in two hours, and that would be approximately a little bit more than twenty percent of the audience they started with, and. For people who want to point out, well, the WWE loses that viewers too, not in those great percentages, except in some cases the third hour of Raw, which that's the third fucking hour. So, uh, and honestly, I don't know how they stay through the WWE programs either. Maybe it's just that they're put in a catatonic state when watching those things. It's like trying to watch water freeze, whereas over here, it's like once you figure out that there's going to be nothing different than the chaos you've already seen for the first 30 minutes or so, you give up. WWE, you watch for the stars. I'm not saying we do, but I think the average fan, they watch for the stars. They'll sit through stuff to see the big stars, and when the big stars aren't really there... The product feels lackluster. When it's a big star, people will sit through all sorts of shit, as we have now found out, yes. just to get 90 seconds with them in the ring or something. For AEW, you watch for the chaos, because that's all it is. In the ring, I'm not only talking in the ring, because you wouldn't see any of the backstage stuff on this show, but it's just you never know who's going to land on their head. You never know what's going to go wrong. People are just going to be bleeding for no reason. <laughs> it's just chaos. But when chaos becomes the norm, you have no chaos. And then they can't out-chaos their chaos. And then people move on to a different form of chaos. Hey, to go back real quick to something we talked about earlier in the week. I think so. Or was it this episode? No, it was earlier who, in the week. Who has any fucking idea at this point? The idea that there'll be a Saturday show and CM Punk will be on that. Presumably for the debut episode on. That's a good move. I mean, just to talk about from a business perspective for Punk, if you don't have to be tied to the dwindling dynamite ratings that keep going down <laughs> and you could start anew with a new show and start here, I don't know. That's better than trying to go rescue this. It's going to be hard to rescue dynamite. Well, but, and then, then again, there is something to be said for the incumbent position, the recognized night, which is a better night for television viewership for that apparently that uh, demographic uh, and just, you know, what they're used to. But for any disaffected people who may say, well, you know what, let's, we like the concept of AEW, but these shows, Jesus Christ, they might want to migrate over. Would you like to migrate 
I guess so. I, just one other thing I'll say. The Adam Cole Jericho stuff didn't perform well here. And they've been building up that stuff even before the big angle here. I think, and I've said this before, even before Jericho got attached to this, for the reasons we knew he would, but I think they may like Adam Cole more than the average fan does or will. And that's even before he gets in the ring and takes off his shirt. I think he seems like a really nice guy. Yeah. But especially this week, just him sitting there saying, let her go to, to whoever, to Jericho. He wasn't even holding her down. <laughs> but I think Adam Cole's now all over this show. Jericho's ideas are all over this show. Just endless people running around. There's so many people in every segment. There's an angle in every segment. So you have to sit through the angle. You have to sit through the angles with the people you don't care about <laughs> to get to a segment that may have an angle with someone you care about. Uh, and by then, you've probably seen the angle earlier in the program. That's right. Right in the segment before it, usually. 